Hello and welcome to this week's Jump Advisory discussion. This week we've got a special guest star Richard Brady joining us uh, to talk about the valuation and how to value your business. Obviously over the last two weeks we've been talking about the value of your business and we always say values in the eye of the beholder but unlike a house where a you know, it's, people only pay, pay what they want to pay for a house. Buying a business is a whole lot different. You know, there's a lot more to take in and there's a lot more proper mathematics and science behind buying a business to put the valuation on that business. So if you can hear me, as always, if you can just please drop your a, a little sort of uh, note into the chat box or the question room, and then we'll kick off because we've got an awful lot to go that cover. So give you an idea about Richard Brady and who Richard Brady is. Richard Brady is an international leader. He's the head of Fair Mountain. He specializes in merger and acquisition as a track record of implementing change and increasing the revenues and improving profitability for blue chip companies and startup alike. He's got 22 years of experience across multinationals with AIG, Zurich, HSBC, etc. And he's got 15 years as an entrepreneur. He's sold and an awful lot of companies just recently, including six last year. He specialised in turnarounds and mergers and acquisitions. He's worked with companies in Hong Kong, in the UK, China, Malaysia, USA, Guernsey, Singapore, etc. So he's extremely well versed in the buying and selling of companies. At the moment, he's got around about 42 companies on a list uh, in his pipeline to buy and sell. So he's spending an awful lot of time evaluating companies and looking at companies. So Richard, I know you've got an awful lot to cover, so I'm gonna throw it over to you. So welcome and thank you much for, for your time, Richard has been much appreciated. So I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you very much for that introduction, Howard. And thank you to the, uh, the team uh, for giving me the opportunity to have a, a conversation. I'll try not to make this an advertorial for Fair Mountain, uh, but effectively we're building a group of professional services companies, and that's why we uh, we talk to businesses, certainly in the recruitment and training spaces, about uh, whether they wanted to join that group. Um, so I, I want to talk about uh, the valuation of businesses. It's a bit of a dry topic, uh, and according to uh, Harvard Business School, there's 126 methods of valuing the business. So I'm gonna go through each of one of those uh, today. <laughs> go on then, I'll, I'll just focus on, on one or two. So it, here are seven of the most um, well-used methods of valuing the business. The first one, market capitalization. I guess most of you would have come across this. This is uh, when you look at a listed company, you take its share price and multiply it by the number of shares and that gives you the value. If you look at uh, point number four there, multiple of EBITDA, this again would probably be something that we've come across previously. It's, it's one of the most well-used ones, certainly for, for small to medium-sized businesses. Uh, and we take EBITDA, we'll talk a little bit about that later, uh, or profit, let's call it profit for the purpose of this conversation, multiply it by a factor, and then that becomes the value of the business. And we'll talk more about how we get that uh, as, we, as we progress. Uh, number five is discounted cash flow. So that's looking at the future revenues for a business and then taking them back to today's values um, taking into effect inflation and then the last one on the list there is liquidation value um, <clears throat> that's sort of fire save sale value really if you had to sell your business tomorrow for some reason what would be the net position of that business and that's where liquidators often look at it or insolvency practitioners so they're just a few examples uh, we'll be focusing on this one, multiple of EBITDA, because I, I would suggest that in the SME world that that's probably 80 to 90% of the ways that values, uh, businesses are valued. Um, as I go through this, if you wanted to ask any questions, uh, you know, if it's, if it's something can pick up on, then please just drop a question in the box and, and I'll get interrupted and we'll, we'll try and cover it at the time. So uh, I suppose the key message here is that Whilst there are many, many methods of valuing them and, and there is some science behind it, it ends up being more of an art than a science. You, you can split it into hard facts. Uh, so that would be based on things such as the numbers, turnover, profit, margins, growth, growth rate, and, and the balance sheet information. Scale is also a big factor. So you could have two identical businesses, but if one produces double the profits of the other. It isn't just double the value, it's double plus some. 
because the, the scale of a business affects its multiple as well as just the, uh, the profit. <clears throat> There's the mix of temporary versus permanent uh, placements, certainly in our sector. Uh, and the reason for that is that if you wake up on January the 1st and you've got a blank order book and it's all about permanent recruitment, it's very difficult to predict future income. Whereas if you've got regular contracts uh, or if you've got uh, business coming through from uh, agreements that you had the year before, the month before, then it's easier to predict future income. And so that affects value itself. Uh, there are other tangibles and other intangibles. And those of you that were on the uh, previous call last week will know that um, you know, tangibles and intangibles were covered in some detail. So ultimately, this is about risk versus potential return for the buyer. Yeah, so you need to be considering that at the point when you're thinking of selling the business. It, it's about what is the risk versus the potential return. Uh, and I think one of the, the messages is that if you are thinking of selling the business in the next couple of years, then you must shape the business for sale. It, it fascinates me that we talk to business owners that are talking about selling and two months before meeting them, they took out three or 400,000 in dividends which immediately reduces the balance sheet and therefore reduces the value of the business. If you take 300,000 out in dividends, you pay um, typically 32.5% dividend tax, whereas if you'd have left it in as part of the sale, you'd be paying potentially 10% tax on that as part of uh, a capital gains tax benefit. So just little tiny things like that can make a massive difference. So you know, using businesses such as Jump to help you shape the business for sale and talking to either M&A advisors or people in this field uh, at least 12 months before you're looking to sell is absolutely invaluable. Uh, and you know, we often say that it's the biggest sale you'll ever make. And if you think of the, the best client you've ever got and how much prep you do for that, you've got to do a lot more for selling your own business. Okay, so this was what was covered previously in terms of tangible assets of the business. So. Uh, things such as your temp contract you know, versus permanent split, which I mentioned, obviously profit trend, uh, the quality of the, uh, the management and any other shareholders and support you've got, uh, you know, you, any, whether you've got an international uh, presence or not. Those are things that are tangible in the business. And then intangible assets are the things that are a little bit more difficult to put your finger on. So the relationships that you've got and intellectual property, the brand recognition that the business has. So that those are factors that I'll call soft facts for the purpose of this conversation. So what are the major contributing factors that affect the valuation of the recruitment agency? Well, we look at all of the hard facts. So that is literally all of the numbers and I'll show you a, a sort of uncompromising slide that shows what we look at on a, a typical valuation. And then we use 49 soft facts criteria. So I mentioned that it, it's an art not a science, this. And so each business that's looking to uh, buy another business or any individual that's looking to buy an agency will have their own list of things. But I'll show you typically what comes onto uh, our criteria. And then ultimately, the value of a business is what one party wants to sell for and the other party wants to buy for. Um, I'm going to tell you all, the one and only joke in M&A, and that is the easiest way to value a business is take the number of directors and multiply it by a million pounds. <laughs> now, I know you're all on mute, but I'm sure you're rolling in the aisles with them, but that is my one and only joke. <laughs> so let, let's take a real life example. This is a, a business that we're talking, I'll obviously change the name for the protection of the innocent, but this shows you um, turnover of the business over the last five years. So we would typically ask for four or five years worth of um, previous um, financial statements. So that's the turnover of the business. So immediately when we look at this, this has got a growing trend. It's, it's not a radical increase. You know, I, one can get worried about a business that's made 50% growth year on year. Uh, but this business has been around for 12 years uh, and they're the last five or six years. As you can see, it's a good steady growth. Similarly, the um, cost of sales has remained consistent. So they've got a business model that they work to regularly, uh, as opposed to if this line was up and down, it might be that they keep changing the business model, changing whether they're using contractors or not, uh, maybe dropping clients. 
So that shows you their gross profit or NFI or GP. Um, you know, different businesses call this different things, but in you know, general business world, this is the gross profit. So that's the money that they've got to spend on running the business and taking profits. Uh, that's overheads, and you can see that's relatively consistent. It's interesting that uh, it went up in 2019, but went down in uh, 2020, which is the opposite of turnover. Uh, and therefore, it leaves us with the most important picture, I suppose, which is the, the net profit. Uh, the reason that uh, 2019 is at 298 is they took quite a big bonus as directors at that point. So you can read a lot just by looking at the, uh, the information that comes from the financial statements. If you're not a numbers person, then again, this is a good area to get a bit of assistance with uh, just to make sure that you do what this business has done, which is, you know, in the last year prior to sale, uh, they've made that a very profitable business, reduced overheads. They kept cash in the bank, as you'll see in a second, and sales increased. So a buyer wants to see a trend <clears throat> that's ideally upward and not going backwards. Okay. So this is a, a collection of summary from the balance sheet from 2015 through to 2020. Uh, so you know, because of the nature of the type of business, there, there isn't typically lots of assets on the balance sheet. Um, one of the assets here is uh, trade debtors. So that's the money that's owed to the business uh, through people that have been invoiced. The other key asset is cash at bank. And you can see that cash has been reasonably well maintained. This is where the, uh, the big bonuses were taking out, but they've managed to just prior to selling, uh, increase the cash at bank, which again, just makes it attractive for anybody that's looking to buy. Um, one of the things that I've come across quite a few times with business owners is there's a mentality that says that the belief is that the money in the bank is uh, money owed to the uh, directors. It is an asset of the business uh, and anybody buying the business would expect to be buying the cash in the bank as well. So uh, whilst you would have heard of uh, transactions, I guess, of buying a business debt-free, cash-free, what that would typically mean is we'll give you X amount to buy the company. You can pay off all of your creditors and take the money from the bank. In practical terms, that, that's not a very sensible way of doing it because again, taking money out of a bank account from the business, you will know you'll either have to pay uh, income tax on that or you pay dividend tax or some other kind of uh, variable. So far better to leave the money in the bank and let the business uh, buyer pay you for the money in the bank as an asset and it's retained there and then you get uh, preferential tax because of that. I'm happy to cover this in, in a bit more detail as we, we go through if you'd like to. Um, I'll just minimize that for a second. Yeah, so I can see that uh, this business then has net assets of 883 and total equity of 883. So that's a sort of accumulation of profits that have not been drawn um, and liabilities taken away from, uh, from assets. So going back to one of the original ways of valuing this business, it could be, if it wasn't a going concern, that it's worth £883,000. Obviously, if it was still a trading or going concern, then the, uh, the value of that is greater. So I apologise in advance for the slide. I couldn't think of any simpler way of showing it, but this is just one of the, if you look at the tabs at the bottom, this is what we would use typically for the valuation of the business. There, you know, there are literally thousands of different questions we ask, but this shows you the, the most important things that we're looking for and hard facts on the business. So how long has the business been trading? What's its net margin? What's the actual profit? Is the profit growing or reducing? Is there a succession plan? So is there a management team in, in uh, place after the sale? What, how much cash is there in the bank at, uh, as a percentage of turnover? What sector is the business in? Uh, what's its uh, ratio between permanent and temporary placements? Is there client concentration? So does it have uh, more than 10% of its business from one particular client? And similarly, what's the cons uh, consulting concentration? So is more than 30% of its business being generated by 
just one consultant. Mm. So these are key factors, and these are all things that you could consider before sale to make sure that you've got a positive answer for those. Because if somebody's buying your business, but you are the primary biller, and you intend to leave the day after the checks cash, then what are they actually buying? It's, it's more a client list, I would suggest, and, and a bit of a reputation. So these are all factors about contingency and making sure that you've got a succession plan so that you can sell that on to the person that's buying the business. And I often think that a good way of looking at it is, would you buy your business? You know, if you were looking at it as a competitor, would you buy the business? And it's a good question to ask. So I apologize in advance, but you can see on here, we look at gross margin, net margin, how much the directors have taken as dividends, um, whether there's a growing or reducing uh, debtor book against the turnover, stock holding days, debtor collection days, liquidity ratio. So all of this stuff isn't really for you to worry yourself about, but I think anybody that's serious about buying business will ask these sort of questions or will be looking at this kind of information. This is all the hard facts. So some of the soft facts then, and things that affect the multiple used. So we're using two, two factors here. One is the hard facts, for the numbers. The other one is the soft facts for the multiple of those numbers. Uh, and that is under things such as your business model, operations, intangibles, the financials, the owners, and a number of things I've already touched upon. Um, and I think we, we look at 49 soft facts. Okay, so if we took a, an example, so we, I've mentioned EBITDA a couple of times there. So that uh, it means earnings, before uh, interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. And it's just really a way of saying, what is the operating profit of this business? Um, so forgetting factors that, that are variable, such as how much tax do we have to pay, and whether or not uh, there are assets in the business that are depreciating, let's just take a, a profit figure, so take it back to the profit figure. So uh, you will hear people flick between either EBIT, which is earnings before interest and tax, or profit or operating profit or EBITDA. Uh, and so they're, they're, they are different, each of those, but for the purposes of you know, simplicity, we'll, we'll talk about profit from this point on. So to value the business then, you typically would take on an EBITDA multiple, profit times a multiple, plus the cash, minus working capital, so it's how much money is in the bank, less what's needed to run the business on a, a month by month basis, minus li liabilities to give you the value. So if I use an example, if the business is making 350,000 profit, so I've substituted EBIT here for profit for simplicity, and the multiple was three and a half times, then the enterprise value for that business would be 1.225 million. Uh, and oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, we'll give you a 1.2 million enterprise value for the business, debt-free cash flow. So that goes back to these points we are talking about earlier. What does debt-free cash flow mean to this particular business? Well, let's add in the cash at the bank. And on this example, the cash in the bank is 400,000. But of course, if you, if you took the cash out of the business, Anybody buying it would immediately have to put cash back in to ensure that they've got sufficient working capital to run the business. Um, so you would add property and other assets. Typically, agencies don't have too many of those. Uh, and you wouldn't necessarily get a pound's worth of value for every asset. So if your only assets were computers and they were five years old, but you bought them for, say, £30,000, you wouldn't get credit for £30,000 because, of course, depreciation would have to kick in. Um, the working capital requirement then for this particular business is 100000 so that would need to be taken away from the value. And then creditors. Uh, and the example I use is, is if you don't take creditors out of the equation, it's a bit like buying somebody's house and paying their mortgage off for them. You know, you need to, to clear any creditors. So the equity value on this business, on this example, would be three and a half times profit, to give you that figure, plus the cash in the bank, and plus the value of the assets, but minus the working capital requirement, 
and minus creditors to give you the equity value, the net equity value of 1.5 million. Now, this next bit here is, is very much um, rule of thumb, finger in the air, but I talked earlier on about scale being a big factor. So if this was a three and a half million pound profit business, it wouldn't mean that it was worth 15 million, it could be worth more than that. And the reason for that would be that this particular factor here, the multiple would increase based on scale. So again, this is, is a rule of thumb, but to give you some kind of quantum on this, if your business is making profits of up to 500,000, then it's likely that you'll be in a range of between two to four times EBITDA. Lots of other factors in there, as I mentioned before, soft facts that affect that, but that would be a kind of rule of thumb. If your profit was, say, between 500 and a million, then it could go three to five times, one to two million, four to six times. And if you're in the two million plus profit area, then it'd be five times plus, you know, and potentially as high as eight times. Uh, but a lot of other factors come in there. So, you know, it is, it is a, a rule of thumb. Another word for multiples in this example could be goodwill. Yeah, because all we're taking is your profit plus a factor, and that factor is the goodwill of the business based on those various criteria that we've already talked about. Richard, quick quick question on the, the multiple, um, and, and apologies if you're covering this later on. How, how much is that affected by things like recurring revenue? So, you know, where people have got longevity in terms of, you know, a three-year deal. Um, how does that change that, that multiple, please? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a key question. And, and I suppose the difficulty is that there are algorithms that we use. Now, again, other businesses will look for more, you know, for, for other factors and will use different uh, criteria. If I just go back to this slide here, um, what we have here is, is various things, and, and temp versus perm would be one of them. We then take what the ratios are of one to the other, and then that gives a score, and that score then is aggregated. So, on this particular example, the multiple that we'd use is 4.15, made up of these various criteria here. Mm. So it does have a, a, an effect, and if it were us, it, it's probably up to 10% of that multiple would come from the mix of um, you know, where the business is coming from, whether it's got a recurring revenue stream or not. But it's definitely a, you know, an important factor. And, and if you th think about it, you know, you're buying the guarantee of future income, and I mentioned earlier on that this is the risk versus the potential reward. Uh, you know, if, if, if all of your business was contracted and I could therefore guarantee next year's income, you'd definitely be in a stronger position than if it was all permanent and it was reliant on people hitting the phones and making the sale. Yeah. Yeah, Richard, I mean, I was uh, going to raise a similar point. I'm uh, constantly talking to clients about uh, the need to get a, a mix between perm and temp <laughs> or contract for precisely the same point you're making, which is the recurring revenue issue. If it's perm only, and it's particularly if it's contingent perm only, then that has a knock on because you, as you've said, there's no guarantee necessarily of recurring revenue. Whereas, as you've made the point, uh, temporary or, of course, um, uh, um, contract opportunities should provide some visibility of future earnings. So, I, you know, this is a point that we consistently make to our clients. And uh, there are an awful lot, as you're well aware, of recruitment businesses who are perm only. So I think it's a valid point and, and, and one worth uh, uh, emphasizing. Yeah, and, and you've, got, you've got two or three key bits. So the temp perm mix is one of them. Uh, concentration risk is another. Uh, I bought a company two years ago that had uh, one big client. Uh, it, it did 80% um, temporary workers and 20% perm. They had one big client with 60% of its temporary business so I bought the business knowing that that was a risk uh, and my business plan was to you know quickly try and mitigate that risk by bringing on other clients I bought the business and four weeks later that client fell off so immediately we had a, a radical drop in in revenue because of it so you know these things happen there's not a lot you can do about that and if your your business is in a situation where you do have a predominance of your uh, 
um, income coming from one customer, you, you really do need to look at how you can then minimize that. How can you spread that across others? Uh, it's the same with consultant risk as well. Uh, if one of your uh, people is the top biller and you're getting 30 or 40% of your income from that one person, that becomes a risk to the business as well. So whilst it's great to have you know, people bringing in the business, if you can somehow or other spread that across a few of your billers rather than just one. Similarly, if you're the key biller in the early stages, you know, the very strong likelihood is that if you're selling your business, whoever's buying it will want you to stay in the business for a period of time uh, so that you don't walk out with, uh, with that revenue going with you. Richard, just on that, you mentioned about succession plans. How, how, how do you actually assess that when you going into a business or looking at a business? You, you know, what, what does succession plan look like from an investor perspective? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, we, we have this conversation all the time. The very starting point for any of the, you know, we're interested in buying your business conversations is why do you want to sell? What do you want to do next? And, and if they want to sell because they're getting close to retirement and what they want to do next is to not work, that that's a red flag for us. If they wanted to sell, but you know, actually what they'd like to do is to bring in some expertise to the board or they, they want to sell in two or three years time, but they want to take some of the money off the table now. So do risk now. And that, that's a real positive for us because we can then work with the exiting directors or exiting shareholders and then find replacements for them. I think that, you know, a business like Jump, one of the key things you should be talking about all the time is the development of your management team, the development of people below you. You almost want to create a situation where you, you have no role in the business. I know that sounds sort of counterintuitive, but we used to talk to business owners about getting their name off the board. And what we mean by that is in the olden days when we all used to use flip charts, we used to write down on a flip chart, what are the jobs that you do that keep that business going? And you know, typically a business owner does everything in the early days and does less in the latter stages. So if you could get it so that the 20 things that you do gets down to three or four things, that's getting your name off the board. And that means somebody coming in to buy it isn't totally reliant on you being there. And therefore you leaving doesn't damage the value of the business. Yeah. I would think any buyer anyway would want you to stay in for a handover period and handover periods can be anything from three, three months to 18 months. Um, so the, the more reliant the business is on you, the longer you will be expected to stay there until they can find a replacement. Yeah, thank you. Now, that is if you've got an external business buying. If it's a trade sale and somebody effectively just wants your top biller and your top customers, then maybe that, that's an easier exit. Uh, but of course, there's, they're fewer and far between than, um, than more professional buyers that are looking to buy. Uh, well, Richard, just a quick question here about... Um, situations like EMI share options, for example, and locking in great consultants uh, and senior staff into a business um, in advance of a sale. Because I, my understanding, and has been my experience, that clearly buyers are obviously very keen to retain the talent in the business because that the talent provides the revenue. Um, is that something that should be considered strongly um, way in advance of moving towards an exit for business owners? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. What, in fact, the business that I showed you earlier, they've got an EMI scheme in there. As it happens, it can get quite tricky because if you've got a number of people in the EMI scheme uh, and the buyer's looking to buy the share table, it, it becomes complex if they're buying, I, I won't call it a liability, but certainly uh, a responsibility for doing something with shares to shareholders that they've never met before. So whilst tying in key people through incentive schemes, long-term incentive schemes is a, a good thing to do, it's well worth sitting with an m and advisor or you know, a business such as ours to talk about the specifics of it. If it's one key person you're tying in, it's maybe not so, so much of a challenge, but if there are five or six, six or seven people that are all part of the scheme that has a, a follow-on responsibility to the new buyers, then that's a consideration for them, I think. It's not, it's not a straightforward thing. You know, a business buyer's got enough to worry about without then having to worry about 
you know, paying for some shares now and still having a, a liability for future shares um, in a couple of years' time. Okay, so if I just move on, uh, deal structure is, is another thing. These are just a couple of examples. I won't go through these in, in any great detail other than to say that um, I, I guess the dream ticket for you as a seller, if it was a million pound business, is to get what I'll call a bullet payment. In other words, the check clears the day that you hand over the share certificates and sign the share purchase agreement and you sail off into the sunset. That, that's unlikely although not impossible, but it is unlikely. Um, I've seen deal structures where a business might be valued at, let's say for the sake of argument, 1.25 million, where if you want a million of it today, you can, but you won't get the other 0.25. Um, a more typical scenario is that you get stage payments or deferred payments. Uh, and this example here shows a, a sort of 40, 30, 30 split of shares. So 400,000 for the million pound business on day one, 300,000 a year later, and the final bit a year after that. That's a very typical deferral. Um, you get longer deferreds where you could, in this situation, say, well, I'd like more than a million pounds than if you want to spread it over a longer period of time. And then this is the dream ticket for the buyer, uh, probably a lot less interesting for uh, the seller, which is a long deferred payment. And these are fixed, price deals. So these are typical sort of structures for fixed price deals where the, the price of the business on this example is a million. There are variable price payments uh, and this is where because you're taking over a longer period of time the one million now becomes a higher figure. So you could say well look I don't mind having the payments over five years but I want 1.2 million not one million. Similarly, there could be some form of uh, performance related payments. So in this particular example, uh, you know, as, as the performance of the business, the profits of the business go up and down, you could have a minimum payment of no less than 250 a year and a maximum payment of no more than 333. So if the business does drop in profits over the period of time that's being, the, the business is being bought, then in that example, you get a minimum payment but if it overperforms, you know, you're capped out. So a cap and a collar. Uh, and then there's a guarantee where part of it is guaranteed and the rest then is contingent on results. Or there's just a purely performance related version. So, I, I mean, the, I guess there's all shades of grey in between these. But I just wanted to point out that it isn't usual for a business to be bought with one single payment on completion. Very typically, buyers are looking to, uh, to mitigate risk. So uh, my sort of final slide really before I take other questions is uh, just a few points, you know, some considerations. Uh, timing is, is critical to this. So if you're thinking of selling the business, it's best to start your preparation at least 12 months beforehand. So even on the basis that you could find a buyer tomorrow, you would ideally want a good reporting year, you know, a full 12 months worth of shaping the business for sale and doing clever things like you know, keeping your costs down. I, I had a conversation with one buyer who decided they weren't going to sell them, but said, look, I, I want to sell in a year's time. And so I gave them some counsel that don't pay yourself for the next 12 months. Now, I know that's not always practical, but if you think about that, if you're taking 100,000 a year in income from the business uh, and could subsidize yourself some other way for a year, that 100,000 pounds a year would add another 100,000 to profits, you would actually net 60,000 from the 100,000. So the cost to you is 60,000. But 100,000 to profit at four times EBITDA is 400,000 extra in the value of the business. So for the cost of 60,000 for the next 12 months, you could increase your value in 12 months' time by 400,000. Now, that's a, an extreme example, but I'm sure you get the point. If you, if you didn't take bonuses or suppressed income for a 12-month period, or did a deal with the other shareholders or some other kind of cute thing with your top consultants where you gave them a capital figure on sale, that's the kind of thing that would be you know, sensible in prep for, for a sale. Also, retaining cash in the bank, as I mentioned to you earlier, you know, money st stored in the bank, every pound in the bank is another pound in value. 
Um, succession planning is something else I talked about. So if you are thinking of selling in 12 months time, you want to be thinking who can take over the funding? Who is there in the existing business? And if there isn't anybody, can I bring somebody in? So I bought a business where the, um, the owner of the business was retiring and didn't want to stay in, didn't even want to work for, for more than three months in the business after sale. But quite cleverly, he recruited somebody in four months earlier that was a regional director in, uh, in recruitment and so had the capacity to take over from him. So that was a really smart move and that, that mitigated our risk and saved us having to try and find somebody. So succession planning and timing is something for, for strong consideration. Uh, we've already touched on this. This is about that mix of business. And if you find that obviously permanent business is very profitable and it, it's good for tomorrow's revenue, but if, if a lot of your business or a majority of the business is in the permanent side and you're thinking of selling, then you know, bringing in that regular income, uh, temporary type of income and, and uh, regular placement is something you should strongly consider. So talking about shaping the business for sale, I'll give me a couple of examples of that. Um, so tax is a key factor here. Uh, and you'll know that you know, it's very relevant at the moment. Um, if we'd have been speaking just over a year ago, I'd be talking about uh, entrepreneurs relief. And therefore, if you sold your business for a million pounds, you've got some personal allowances to take off that. But broadly, the business um, would be worth net to you, broadly speaking, about 900,000. The year before that, you could have sold a business up to 10 million pounds and you would have only been paying 10% tax. So the rules have changed quite significantly. So now any capital gain that you make, you have a lifetime allowance and there's something called business asset disposal relief. That means you can sell a million pounds worth of assets and only pay 10% tax on that. So it was called entrepreneurs relief. Last year it's business asset disposal relief. The reason it's very critical now is that there's a budget happening in March and in March, it's almost certain that tax benefit will be adjusted. Um, worst case scenario, it could be adjusted to match income tax. Uh, and so therefore, you know, the gain on your business or the gain that you've made on your business uh, could be actually halved. Uh, or there might be some other kind of uh, deal where the million pound lifetime allowance is reduced. So if you literally are in the stage of selling the business now, then my proposal to you would be try and get that completed before uh, the budget. Because, you know, if the budget comes in and that rule comes in straight away, then that would be a, a big issue. So taking of cash, dividends and, and capital is something that, you know, a tax advisor could advise you on. An MA advisor would have some kind of a, you know, support in that area but tax advisors will know your own personal situation as well and therefore be able to tell you the best way of, of shaping the business prior to sale. Um, and then the other thing is, again, if, if you're looking at 12 months from now, what kind of handover period do you want to do? Are you prepared to work in the business? And, and I'd say to you that the less you dictate at the point of sale, the easier it often becomes to make the sale. Uh, you know, I've, I've opened a, a conversation with a business seller before where they said, this is the price I want. This is the structure and the way I want it structured. And I'm not prepared to work for more than three months. And that was just a very short conversation because it needs to be a negotiation. And I go right back to one of my early slides, which is that the value of a business is worth what, not only what you want to sell it for, but what the buyer wants to buy it for. And so it is a sort of combination of those two. So that, uh, you know, that covers my slides and the things I wanted to touch on. It, it is one of those subjects that you could you could spend weeks on it really and have a full course on this. So apologies for, for doing that at a fairly high level, uh, but hopefully it's given you some food for thoughts. Uh, and I'm very happy to attempt to answer any questions you've got. Richard, that's given us a lot of food for thought. Thank you very much. And I think before the guys jump in, I think we should, there's a couple of questions that have come in from uh, the attendees. So if you want to ask more questions, guys, feel free to send them in. So Susie Ankritz asked, do investors have a sweet spot for profit? Um, yeah, great question. Um, well, it depends on who the investor is, I guess. Uh, I think I think scale comes you know comes back to scale a lot of times. If you looked at private equity um, as being you know maybe in, in, in the larger side of, of acquisitions, 
private equity are looking for a million pounds plus, typically. Uh, trade buyers, then it depends on the size of the business that's buying. Uh, businesses such as ourselves, which are sort of below the, the private equity group, we, we'd be looking for 500,000 to a million, very typically in profit terms. Um, so it, it really does depend on who's buying. Uh, I, you know, the, the bottom line is if, if the business is sub 100,000 profits, then it probably is just maybe a one or two man band or it's, it's a business that's not got its margins quite right. And therefore there's a lot of risk in a business of that scale and that size. So that, you know, without this being an advertorial, that's where you want guys from Jump um, to help. You know, what, what should I be doing? How can I improve my margins? You know, how can we drive the top line? I think to, to add to that question, because Jim's jumped in uh, with the, the, the question I was just about to add, when we talk profit in a sweep spot for profit, are we talking as in pound notice profit, or are we talking about a percentage that's maybe dropped down from the top line, you know, that you know, we're making 25% profit, 10% profit, whatever it be. So I think there's a difference between the two there. So how would you differentiate there? Is a, is a sweet pot, you've, you've given the sweet spot regarding cash, what about the sweet spot regarding uh, percentage? Okay, yeah. So, I mean, margins are a function of business model. So, whilst it's great to see a gross margin, so gross margin is the, uh, the number between your turnover and your, uh, you know, the, the next figure after cost of sales. Whilst it's good to see a nice healthy margin there, the net margin is the turnover to your net profit. But it's a function of the type of business that you're doing. So, if you've got a big um, temp book, your margins will be lower, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the business value is less because of that. So I'd say pound notes uh, profits are more important than margins. Uh, and as long as the margins aren't out of kilter with, with averages, then you know, that, that's a different factor. Right? So you know, buying a business where the net margin is 30 or 40% in, in lots of worlds is great. But if that is 30 or 40% because you have to sell uh, new new permanent placements month in month out, then there's a risk associated with that. So the actual amount is the key determinant factor for most businesses buying. Okay, so, so Jim has actually asked us because obviously his business is, is slight. If some niches don't actually sort of work well with that blended contract and per mix because their market is just purely a permanent market, they're in they're in tech sales. When a client, when people like yourself start to look at businesses like that where they have a very good strong market and a very good holding market, is that taken into account when you start to look at uh, grading the the, the business? It, it is. It's still, it's still a risk, but then we'd look at the contract. So, you know, at that stage, who are you dealing with? How big are those firms? You know, what kind of longevity have they got? How long is the contract for? Can they get out of it easily? So it, it's back to the same principle, really, which is what is the confidence I've got that you did a million last year, you'll do a million or more next year. And that is then around the, the contract. So, yeah, I, I get the point on you know, if you're not in a situation where it's a guaranteed income, but if the contract says that we'll still work with you and we've got to give six months notice and it's a five-year contract, that's, that's obviously a lot better than if it's a month-by-month -month contract or indeed if it's non-exclusive. Yeah. So if we use you and five other agencies, then that, that is a risk for the business and therefore reduces value. So part of your intangible assets is to have make sure you've got all your contracts in, signed and, and, and sorted out before people like you start to come and sort of dig under the bonnet of the, of the business to really have a look at that. Hmm. And Lapham's asked a question here as well, and I think this is sort of pertinent to everybody really. Has the price to sell been affected by the current situation? Should you expect to, should you expect to obtain less if you're selling this year? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I read a lot of the trade reports on private equity in the US, Europe, and in the UK. Uh, and if you'd asked me this six months ago, it was an absolute definite yes. And I think the average, um, you know, there may even have been a, an element of buyers using that as an excuse, but the average reduction in values was 30%. Um, but, you know, now that we're at the end of the year, um, and this, you know, this, it looks like the light at the end of the tunnel, Looking back over 2020, the, the sort of net reduction is only about 10% in typical values. And then the first quarter projections, because obviously we, you know, businesses are talking um, at the moment to companies, and so therefore they're feeding that information in, even those, those transactions haven't been done, is a 10% increase in values. So 
there's definitely been a blip and there was an effect. But I think today, if you were starting your conversations today, uh, as long as you've not been radically affected by um, the crisis and as long as you had a, a healthy enough uh, balance sheet, then it's almost been washed out of the system. Now, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to use large generalizations. It will be down to each individual business. Uh, and I've yet to see you know, many businesses that thrive through the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, there were one or two, but most of them took a bit of an impact. Uh, and, and as long as you can say, well, look, you know, sales dropped by 15%, but that's because of, however, you know, the first quarter of this year, we look like we're back on track again. And I think most buyers would, would accept that. But, you know, six months ago, it was a very different conversation. So how would that look then? So I've got a, a number of clients that are exactly what you say. They've, they've had a bit of a poor time sort of uh, in uh, through lockdown and it's dips and they're now coming back up again. But I've also got the clients of the way around who've absolutely nailed it and absolutely over, over exceeded uh, through lockdown. Would that then be viewed in a really positive light or is that just, again, would it be taken into account and then sort of uh, graded depending on what people think has caused their upsurge in business? Yeah, I, you know, a lot of this is now down to the story that you tell, you know, so I, I always think that every seller has got a story and every buyer should have a story of what they're trying to do. So if you can, you can add that in as an advantage, part of your intangibles, if you will, which is we're, you know, we're, we're recession proof or we were COVID proof. I, I put that as part of the story. So, you know, when I'm talking to any potential seller about a business, I want to know the story, you know, like what, what's led you to this point, why you're now looking to sell. Uh, and so I would feed in factors such as, and even through the crisis, we managed to find either because of, you know, we've got great systems or we're in a sector that uh, needs PPE or whatever it might be. You know, put, put that as part of the story. So it would definitely help to the valuation for sure. Okay, that's good to know. So Andy Turner is asking, I know profit is sanity, but I was told a few years ago that if your turnover was over 10 million per annum, then you became a much more visible to the bigger boys or buyers in general. Is that still the case? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, and it depends then on whether you're with a broker and the broker is uh, advertising in that way or if, if you have been found by... Uh, a business like ours that's looking to buy those companies and they might be looking for turnover of businesses. So it gets you on the radar. But ultimately, you know, the business model and the profits created are what a buyer will, will pay for. You've seen just from a couple of slides that we put there, we go into a lot of detail and anybody that wants to write a check for, you know, typically multiple millions will want to know as much about that business as they possibly can. So, uh, you know, the old vanity and sanity argument is true. Uh, but yes, you will get get raised attention if your turnover is, is above the 10 million mark, for sure. Okay, and the last question we've got here, I'm not going to name the person because uh, obviously I think it might be personal to them, but as a director, they're paying approximately uh, £1,000 per month as an employee into the pension. Is it advisable in terms of taking money out of the business? Uh, yeah, absolutely great idea. I think, you know, a lot of people don't really think about pensions in, in the way of you know either business value or a tax efficient way of paying yourself uh, again it depends on your circumstances and how close you are to retirement but taking a thousand pounds out of your business and paying yourself you net i'll, I'll, I'll round all these numbers but you'll net 600 pounds taking a thousand pounds out and putting it into your pension it gets grossed up so that becomes a 1400 pound um, amount that you've taken for your own benefit it grows in your pension then in a tax efficient manner and then when you take it out it's you know, a quarter of it's tax free so if you've got the option of taking income from your business and don't necessarily need to spend it it's just going in your personal bank i would definitely say use pensions for that i mean you can get very smart then and use that same pension pot to buy a property that your business then works from uh, and so then the business can be paying rent to your pension pot that owns the property you know these are all kind of really cute things you can do so any kind of money into pension nearly always is a great thing to do so i've got another question just coming there would you suggest is there any online platforms which can solicit interest for sale yeah so you, you've got you've got a whole range of options that there, there are uh, you know, Dalton's and, and places like this. If you Google it, you get a whole list of 
places that you could advertise your business for sale. You could use a, an M&A advisor. M&A advisors typically are looking for bigger businesses, so minimum of 500,000 profit, but more likely, you know, a million plus. But th those guys are very professional about what they're doing. You've got an interesting world as well of, of business brokers. Um, business brokers, it's a bit like the Wild West, really. There's no regulation for business brokers. So you've got some really, really good ones, and you've got some less than good ones. Uh, and I'd say to you that before you just sign up with a broker, shop around quite a bit. One of the things that they do is a bit like the old days in the state agency. If you talk to five brokers, one of them will tell you your business is worth 10 million. And your instinct there is to go with the one that said the biggest figure. But what they do to get that calculation is something called ad backs. So they'll take your profit figure and they make an adjustment where they add in your salary, maybe add in pension contributions, then add in your company car and your friend's income. And you get to a figure that actually does not exist. And then they multiply that by a very high factor to get a valuation. So I'd, I'd air caution with business brokers. There are some very reputable ones out there, but you need to shop around a bit and just be careful and mindful of the fees that they charge. Um, but yeah, so there, there are lots and lots of ways you could advertise your business for sale um, through using the whole range of things. And, and you know, I, I'm happy to talk with the guys at Jump and if anybody was serious about wanting to take that stage further, I could give them a list of, of options. That's been a really interesting sort of, I was going to say 45 minutes, but it's now been nearer 50 minutes. Before we sort of disappear, Dave, Paul and Paul, have you any questions that you want to, to pitch in as well that you may have got from some of your clients? Oh, yeah, think, this is cool. one, it, just around the valuation. So Richard's kindly agreed to help uh, any jump clients out. So if anybody needs a valuation uh, doing, uh, then we've, we've got a special arrangement in place with, uh, with Fair Mountain to, to do that. So just reach out to one of us and we'll connect you with Richard. Uh, yeah, sorry, just on that point. So it, it's, it's an arrangement we've only got with Jump. We haven't done this with anybody else. So when we were having our conversations, you know, Jump's whole premises to try and increase the value of businesses we're looking at potentially buying businesses so we've got a professional arrangement that said we'll give you a valuation you know so it, it's clearly not fully independent but it's as independent as we can be uh, and you don't need to use any of our other services for that but then that gives you a good starting point and maybe we're more conservative than a broker would be um, and so you could then go and talk to brokers and see what the difference is between the two we're we're buyers, of course. They're, they're looking from the sales side, typically. But I think that might be a useful service for, for any of you uh, that is seriously considering that in the next 12 to 18 months. Thanks, Richard. And just to support that point, Richard, I think this, this issue of getting businesses ready for sale doesn't just happen, you know, a few weeks or a few months in advance. You know, the, as you pointed out, the sooner you start to prepare, whether it's 12 months or indeed three years beforehand, the better it is. And... Um, uh, I think that the uh, the metrics that you've provided, you know, going back over five years um, is an important point. Most people don't think of it in terms of looking back that far in history, but I think the, the further that you can go back and show trends and, and improvements, obviously the better. This point about succession planning, huge point in the conversations we have with our clients, preparing other people to take on more and more responsibility to, in a sense, as you've said, uh, make the owners almost redundant, partially redundant. You, want, you know, All owners ultimately want to get to that point where they have limited levels of responsibility. Your point about the, the, you know, the flip chart I thought was well made. And uh, I think those are important points. And lastly, the concentration with client base, how much clients spending with you, the broader the client base, the, 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 if you like, the, the broader the concentration, makes the business more valuable and likewise with consultants uh, to ensure that you've got more than just a few uh, you know large fee earners better to have a broader breadth as it were of fee earners who contribute to the profit so absolutely fantastic points really really interesting thank you thank you uh, Richard, thank you i was going to say it's been a great session the one thing i was just going to remind people of is that often when they've engaged in the start of the sales process that process itself can take three six months and as business owners it's really important to be able to keep the business going and keep the trend going during that time because often your eye can be off the ball because you've got to produce a lot of data 
and that, that's a really important thing to do and um, you know, I think Richard picked up on that earlier on. I think it's interesting. I've been working with quite a lot of my clients just recently on uh, the uh, processes, who owns the processes and who owns the function. And it's really interesting. The business owners own it all. And they're suddenly realizing that they've now got to sort of almost abdicate all of this out to their business and then create that succession plan of who's coming into there. Richard, it was a, a very, very interesting, as I say, 45, 50 minutes. So thank you very much for your time. It's been very much appreciated. Um, as we said, we've, with another one of our uh, uh, partners, Firefish, Paul Sharp is speaking with them. Is it on this afternoon, Paul, or is it next, next week? Wednesday, Howard, next, 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 Wednesday. next Wednesday, about how to take on the big boys using the RPO method and working from there. Next week, we have a very special guest coming in. We have Neil uh, Carberry, the head of the REC, coming in. We've got four really great topics to sort of quiz Neil over. So as soon as you finish this webinar, hopefully just log straight on to that get yourself booked in because we expect that to be an extremely busy webinar uh, as always if you like what we've been doing please put a post out on linkedin and send it to us uh, that'd be much appreciated uh, so we can use that as always we're offering our usual one-to-one -one, uh, free sessions for an hour for 60 minute mentor sessions if you've not taken those up all that leaves to say is once again thank you richard for your time it's been much appreciated and thank you very much indeed ladies and gentlemen that's this week's discussion over thank you very much guys from jump and we hope you have a good week and we'll see you all next week thank you very much bye everybody keep safe keep well thank you bye, -bye.